שלום עליכם, שבוע טוב. שבוע טוב. We don't see you. You don't see me? Ah, here, yeah, okay. Hello. I will start maybe, there are so many things to say. I will start maybe with, with the way that it started and the way that, uh, that I see it as a, as a rabbi at the hospital. It started about uh, two months ago. Uh, about two months ago, one day uh, I, uh, I get a phone call and, uh, and on, the call, on the phone it's, uh, it's the police. And uh, I asked, so what do you want from me? What did I do? So they tell me, no, there was a, a kid, a little, uh, a little girl that called us a few minutes ago, two minutes ago. And I check with my kids. My kids know that calling 911 is a big, uh, big no-no. And, um, and I ask my kids, and one of them tells me, yes, it was me, and she's very, she feels very uncomfortable, she feels very afraid. I said, okay, I told the police, I'm sorry, I don't know what she wanted, but everything is okay, you can come, you can confirm. That day later, my, uh, my daughter comes and uh, tells me, uh, Daddy, you remember that you told me, you promised me that if I say the truth, uh, you won't do anything bad to me, nothing bad will happen to me. I told her yes. So she tells me, so I want to tell you that it was me that called the police. I asked her, okay, and why, why did you do that? So she tells me, I called them to tell them, that, well, she saw that, uh, that uh, her grandmother cannot come. She saw that I, uh, I get a lot of phone calls to the hospital. She saw that I, uh, that I, uh, you know, that I come back home with a mask. I leave home at ma with a mask. When I come home, I need to follow a certain protocol of, of the hospital that I right away need to go to take a shower, change all the clothes and everything. She, so she tells me, I called the police. She's, she's, she's uh, five years old. She told me, I called the police to tell them that uh, there is a corona and I'm afraid of it. And if it's possible for them to come and take it away because I'm afraid of it. So this is from the eyes of a, of a little girl, innocent, pure little girl. But definitely we see that uh, this corona changed uh, our lives in many, many ways. Now, the way that it changed it is, uh, let's be realistic. In the world itself, nothing really changed. In the world itself, it's not that, uh, let's say theoretically, if, uh, if there's a person that lives in a cave somewhere on a mountain and he has no internet connection and he doesn't get the, the newspapers and he doesn't have a television as well, would, any, would he experience any difference? I highly doubt it. It's not that the sun suddenly comes out uh, pink or the air changes its color to brown uh, or the trees now grow yellow. Everything is normal. But for us, the way that you perceive things, the way that we see things, our reality, the way that we interact is, is very, very different. Now, um, how, how does it uh, affect our lives on a daily basis? I think the three greatest elements that, that I see, at least from the hospital, and the guidance that, uh, that we get in the hospital is social distancing, wearing gloves, and put a mask. Now, from those three, each and every one of them is a subject of itself. I had to focus on one. So I chose the mask. How the mask that, uh, that we wear now during uh, COVID-19, how does it uh, change us, the impact that it has? And I tried to, do, uh, to, uh, to bring it to a practical level. So besides of sharing stories from the hospital, to bring it into a practical uh, aspect of what can we learn from it. Chaz um, v'shalom, that, uh, that anyone should be hurt from, uh, from this. All of us pray and want this pandemic to go away. But since it's already here, um, you know, there's a, once had in the, in the hospital, it happens every once and it's rare, but it happens that, um, that a patient comes in with an ambulance and, uh, and he tries to go out of the bed and he falls. So I, I've seen, I've experienced this case uh, a few weeks ago and uh, I saw that he fell. And, uh, and I saw that one of the nurses says, oh, babe, what did I do? What did I do? I, I let him fall, I let him fall. And she was in a very panic mode. And then another nurse that just came in, a nurse and a doctor that came in and said, forget about what you did. Let's focus on what we can do from now on. So none of us wanted this virus to come, but since it's already here, so we're trying to figure out what it is that we can learn from it. So I, uh, I divided it into nine, uh, nine points. Each and every point is, I think, a lesson that we can, uh, look in, we can learn from. 
So number one is protection. The, the, um, the mask is here to protect us. Uh, and this protection uh, means that on one, on one hand, yes, it's not easy for us to put the mask, but, uh, but it's here to protect us. And it's like this in, in life in many ways, that there are certain things that limit us, certain things that we do not like wearing, we do not like having with us all the time, but at the end of the day, it's to protect us. About two months ago when this started, there was a big wedding, a wedding that um, could be that some of you uh, know about, uh, but it was a wedding that from this wedding, um, sadly, many people got, uh, got infected. Uh, it was evening. I finished with the kids. I finished whatever I had to do at home. And I was on my way. I was driving to that wedding. On my way, when I was still on, uh, I didn't pass the carry, um, I get a pager to the hospital. And, uh, and I needed to go to the hospital. I felt very bad because it was a good friend of mine. Um, but I had to go to the hospital. There was an, an emergency that I had to take care of. Uh, a day later, I called. I apologized to the person that I could not make it to his wedding. Um, but eventually, at the end of the day, I realized that this is what saved me. Because uh, many people from this wedding got, uh, got infected. And uh, in a way, I got saved. So uh, the lesson for me from this first, uh, first aspect of protection, that the mask is here to protect us, some of the things that we experienced are not necessarily comfortable things, or we feel as if we miss out something because I limited myself, because I did not do. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's for our benefit. Um, now, in addition to that, the protection itself of the mask is it protects the other person from us. The fact that we put something on our face, so it's a protection from something that, um, that is, uh, that is um, uh, besides us, friends or people that are close to us. There is a story that, uh, that can uh, maybe illustrate it a little bit about uh, a tzaddik that was, uh, that was going with the students. And they, uh, they, were, they woke up early and they did the shacharit and they did their daily learning. And then they walked all home together from the synagogue. And then they see this person that just woke up. It was already 10, 11 a.m. A person that just woke up. His eyes were still swollen. And he is on his way to Daven Be to pray be in uh, in the synagogue. So one of the people, one of the congregants, told the, the rabbi, Ah, rabbi, you see, <clears throat> he is not like us. We already finished learning. We finished uh, to do the shaharit. We finished everything. Not like some people that wake up very late and only now go to the synagogue. So the rabbi told him, Yes, you're right but he did not have the chance to say Lashon Ara yet today. So sometimes the, the mask that we put, something that's a protection also to what we take out, because we know that this virus, uh, the, the, a person can get contaminated. The, the worst way is uh, by droplets that we take out from our mouth. So this protection that we put, this limitation that we put on ourselves is actually for the benefit of us and for the benefit of others around us. This is point number one, protection. Second, uh, second um, point is um, kisui. Kisui is a cover. So the cover, um, the cover itself is uh, when we when you go with the mask, it's very hard to um, to see people. It's very hard to recognize people. There are sometimes in the hospital people that I that I know them for for a year, two or three, but with a big big mask and with a face shield. <clears throat> it's very hard for me to recognize them or them when I'm in the hospital now. I'm, I completely, I have to completely fold my beard and I don't put one mask. I need to put two masks. So it's hard for people to recognize me. Um, but it's a great chance if I look at uh, the deeper aspect of it, that yes, you might not recognize a person in front of you, but it's possible for you to get to know a new person, which means you don't look only on the superficiality, you look at something deeper. And I'll give an exa a few examples, a few stories. On, uh, usually on Pesach at the hospital, we do a, we do a big seder, a public seder, and you have between 80 to 100 people. It's a very, very beautiful seder because it's a seder that has a mixture of everything. You have people that are there, and it's the first seder that they do in their lives, which means it's a, it's a fresh um, couple, that have a baby and the mother is still not released home. She's still in the hospital. So it's the first seder for their baby in the hospital. 
and some of them, for them, it's the, it's the last letter in their lives, people in palliative care. So the entire family comes to celebrate the Leila Seder with them, the Pesach Seder with them. So it's a, in a way a public Seder for patients and their families. This year we could not make it. So uh, we distributed the uh, Passover uh, Seder kits, a small box that has everything in it. Now, this usually I have volunteers that, prepare, that pack them, that prepare them. I have schools that do them. I have uh, st students that, uh, that are giving them out. <clears throat> it's a beautiful project. This year, I'm not allowed, no one is allowed into the hospital. Um, I cannot bring anything from outside the hospital. I can't have any volunteers to help with it. It means that I have about 100 packages to prepare, all the simanim, all the food, everything to be packed. And, and I have to do it on my own inside the hospital. Why? Because of sanitation, because of the virus. Erev Pesach, Mama's day before Pesach, I finished doing uh, B'dikat Hametz in the house. Um, and uh, I tell my wife, listen, oh, I have to go to the hospital. I have to start working on it. And she tells me, Barak, it's impossible. You won't be able to make it. You have 100 packages. It's now about 10 p.m. You'll never make it. I told her, listen, I have to try. Whatever will happen, will happen. I go to the hospital. Um, I say to who, from those of you that know Pavilion K, the food court. Uh, so on my way, as I'm, as I'm walking through the, the K Pavilion there, I see someone, uh, someone that I know, someone that I always say hello to. And uh, a worker in the hospital. He works in maintenance and uh, he was there. And as our roads cross, I say hello, I say good evening. And then I start asking, how are you doing? How's the family? And he was a little stressed, so, so he, you know, he, he elaborated, he started talking. And I said, you know what, I'm giving this guy now a few minutes. I told him, let's sit down and talk. And we sit down in, in the food court and we talk about, about different things. And he asked me, Rabbi, what are you doing here at this time? So I told him, look, I'm here, I need to prepare packages. And no one is allowed in. Um, so he told me, oh, Rabbi, you know what, I'll help you. Do you need help? I'll help you. <clears throat> I told him, you know what? It's, it's a great, uh, you're a savior for me. He said, you worked with me. We finished packing around 3.30 a.m. The day later, we needed to put the fresh food that we got from the kitchen at around 9 a.m. and then giving it out to all the patients in the hospital. He was there at 9 a.m. as well. Now, the funny part of it is that when I met him at 10 a.m., he was about to go for a week vacation. He was, uh, it was his week of vacation, uh, and therefore he wasn't working in the hospital, so he could help me a day later. And he was able to, uh, to work with me until very late because he had no problem because he was on vacation. <clears throat> this is a perfect example, I think, for, um, for a new person that you meet. This, this concept of mask, on one hand, you don't know the person behind the mask. On the other hand, it's possible for you to get to know someone new that, that you never knew before. So, uh, so we helped you with this. We prepared everything. We gave out everything. Um, now, I, I advertised it on the evening that we made it. I advertised it. Someone saw it and told me, you know what? If you're doing this, then I'm giving you uh, flowers to give to all the patients. So when we gave out everything, we were able to give it out with, uh, with flowers to every patient for Yom Tov. It was uh, uh, beautiful. Now, when, uh, when I say you get to meet someone new because of the mask, it's in many ways. There were certain people in the hospital that I thought that, you know, between me and them, you know, we don't share many things in common. I barely had any interaction with them. I don't know how much they respect the Jewish religion, how much they respect the rabbi, but, but they're there, they work there. I give them the, the, the respect and that's it. But because of the mask, I realized that there are people behind the mask, which are much more than I, than I ever thought. Um, I, an example would be uh, one of the doctors, a doctor that, um, the perfect doctor for this. We barely, I barely, maybe I spoke to him for the last three weeks that I work in the, three years, I'm sorry, that I work in the hospital. Maybe I've seen him and spoken to him two times, three times. He calls me up um, a few days ago and tells me, listen, Rabbi, I'm sorry that, I, uh, that I'm calling you like this, but I have here a patient, it's a Jewish patient. He's a religious uh, person. You know, no one is allowed to come into the hospital and, uh, and he's a dying patient. Uh, and please, I need your help. I need you to come and make the final prayers with him. Um, 
So I came, I came, I did the final prayers. The interesting part with this, by the way, during COVID, just as a, as a side note, for the past two months in the hospital, I've seen miracles with my own eyes, miracles that it's hard to express, but on a daily basis, you can literally see miracles. This is one of them. So, uh, so I come, I do, uh, I do the bidu, I do everything with the person. A day later, the Hebrew Kadisha calls me and tells me, listen, Rabbi, we have a problem. The hospital does not let the, the body go. Um, and they can't find it, they can't track it. The wife of the, per the person is very anxious, she's very stressed. They want to make the levaya, but we, they can't find the person and no one tells us who, where he is in the hospital. Oh, no problem, let me check it. I called this doctor and the doctor tells me a day later, he tells me, now when I was called, they told me he has between one to two hours, not more than that. Uh, the doctor tells me, listen, I'm sorry, Rabbi, I don't know what to tell you, but, uh, but he didn't die and actually feels much better. And uh, I assume that, uh, that he's gonna go home in a few days. I assume he's gonna go home. I really apologize for, uh, for I, don't know, I don't know how it happened. It's, it's, uh, I can't explain it, but it did. Uh, but this was a perfect example for me, for, uh, for someone that I didn't know. I was, in a way, judging him by the one or two conversations that I had with him. Uh, but the mask, this, uh, this, uh, uh, it forced me, it forces us to look deeper into a person. It forces us to, uh, to see who the person behind the mask is. Not judging by the, the superficiality, rather look into a deeper aspect of a person. They say that uh, yeah, right now you can't really see a person when he's talking but you can only see his eyes. And it says that uh, the eyes are the window, windows for the neshama. So the lesson for me from it is, number one, give every person a chance not just to express who he is, but look at something deeper. It can be with, with the kids, with our family, um, not to judge the kid based on what he says, rather think why he said it, what's the meaning behind it. Uh, this is something that I think the mask really, really um, uh, gives us, um, gives us uh, the opportunity. Separation, point number three, the separation. So the, the mask separates between, uh, between myself, who I am, and the world around me. It's something that stands here, and uh, it's a differentiation, it separates. But I think that if you look at it in a deeper aspect, it separates from many, many things. It separates between, it causes a certain reality that it separated um, things that are natural and fundamental for us. Um, it can be between kids to their parents. It can be between grandchildren and their grandparents. Uh, it can be between things that we know that were obvious to us, such as uh, praying in a minyan. Let's be honest, <clears throat> our community the suffering in our community is, is so, so much felt. Bar mitzvah, brit milah, uh, um, bat mitzvah, kriyat Torah, all of these things are things that are in our community, our fundamentals, our basics. And suddenly we have to differentiate ourselves from what we know, from what we've known until now to a new reality. And it is caused by this virus. So, I see it that uh, I see that um, this separation um, is, as, 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 as I said, in all aspects, from a person to his work, um, and uh, and from everyone. An example for it, a story, also a very interesting story, was uh, was something that um, the story was like this. I get a call um, from some, from a friend of mine that the story is like this. We have someone that is in the hospital and um, his son and his wife, it's an older person, he's in ICU intubated. His son and his daughter, I'm sorry, his son and his, um, his, um, no, his wife, his, the son and the wife uh, are with the virus at home and they both feel that they have hard time breathing and they need to go into the hospital. They need to be uh, hospitalized. Uh, now, the problem is that they can't both go, go to the hospital. Why? Because they have three little children. The, the, the oldest one is, I think, seven, seven or eight. So you can not, not leave the kids on their own. Uh, you, can't bring someone, you can't bring a babysitter because it's high risk. Um, 
and you can't bring the kids anywhere because it's high risk for them or for those surrounding them. What do you do in such a case? I called social worker, I called a few of the doctors, I called the head of departments. They all told me like this, Rabbi, in our worst scenario, we didn't envision such a thing happening. We're not prepared for it. We have no answer. So what was done in this, uh, in this uh, particular case, the father, the father was taken right away to emergency room. They gave him priority. They took care of him right away, and he was eventually was able to, uh, to be, after two or three days, he was, uh, he was back home feeling better. But, but we can see that it, it completely separates between the reality that we've known so far and the, the, the new reality that, uh, that exists. Now, um, uh, another example was uh, Erev Pesach. I came back home after we gave all the kids. I came back home, I take a shower, and we start Kadesh Uchatz. As we start Kadesh Uchatz, I get a call. I get a call. Um, I had to go to the hospital. It's a dying patient. A dying patient, um, I did whatever was needed with him. And uh, the daughter called me later. The daughter told me like this, Rabbi, I live in Australia. I tried getting any flight possible to come and be with my father, but I wasn't able to because there were no flights. If you wouldn't go there uh, when he, when he, uh, in his last moments, I would never, ever, until I die, I would never forgive myself for the fact that I wasn't there. And she, she said how much she appreciates the fact that someone was with him and he wasn't there when he was, uh, when he was alone. But still, it's another example to show that uh, there's a certain split, this differentiation that, uh, that, is, that it causes in our daily lives. Um, another example was uh, also Erev Yom Tov. Not Yom Tov, sorry. Not Erev Yom Tov, on Yom Tov. Um, I finished my rounds in Bogusham. There are many positive things. During the, for some people, it's enough to give them a visit. For some people, it's enough that they see someone that they know, that they see something that they know to give them strength or to make the connection between the family and the patient. Some, well, no one is allowed in, so family is not allowed. Visitors are not allowed. So in a way, I'm trying to bridge between, you know, between all those uh, that cannot see each other. Uh, an example was, uh, the story was, on Yom Tov itself, I'm on my way to go home. It was late, uh, late afternoon. And, uh, and then I see two people that, uh, that rush into the hospital. And they tell me, oh, are you the rabbi? I told them yes. And they tell me, please, we need a favor. And we're not allowed in. And the story was like this. Their father um, got into the hospital on Erev Yom Tov of, uh, of Pesach. And his wife always called, every day called to check how he's doing. And then he was intubated. When he was, while he was intubated, his wife got the, the virus and was hospitalized in a different hospital. While he's, while he's intubated, his wife herself got intubated. When he was extubated and he started feeling better, um, his wife became worse. And on, uh, on the second day of um, on Pesach, on Shvisha Pesach, I'm sorry, on Shvisha Pesach, uh, his wife passed away. And, uh, and his kids came, they wanted to tell their father that their mother died, that his wife died, but they were not allowed in. And they wanted to know what to do with the body, whether they should bury her, they shouldn't bury her, and if it, he bought a special plot for her in Eretz Yisrael, whether they should take, how, how can they take her? If yes, if no. Um, so, so I had to go and tell it to the father. And had to, he was supposed to give an answer. What does he want to do with, with his wife? Uh, it, it was a very, very, very hard experience that we can see that the reality, in a way, uh, created a, a, a complete, complete separation between, uh, between what we have known until now and what we, have, what we can, what we should actually do from now on. Um, the the fourth fourth point is um, oh I'm sorry I'm sorry we'll end we'll we'll end this with with something positive this uh, this uh, third point with uh, with the packages that we gave the Passover packages also uh, we had uh, we had an older woman that uh, when I was giving out the packages on uh, before Pesach 
So one of the nurses tells me, oh, Rabbi, thanks God that you are here. I asked her what happened. So she told me, we have here a lady, a very old lady. Today is her birthday. And she keeps crying. We, we really fear for her health because she says that it's impossible for her. Her entire life, she celebrated Passover. Her entire life, she ate matzah and Pesach. And now she says, I'm here in the hospital. No one is allowed to bring anything in. Uh, and I, I'm going to have, I'm not going to have a, Pas a Passover seder. I'm not going to have a matzah. And, and now I see you giving out those packages. And uh, it's great. It's going to be a lifesaver for her. I went, I, I gave her the package. She celebrated this evening, Erev Pesach, she celebrated 101. It was her birthday, 101, and she was able to get it. So you see that although things are separated, it's possible for, for us sometimes to do this connection with the separation, um, and it, it simply re, it can revive a person. Uh, point number four. <clears throat> The, the desire or the, uh, the will, the ratzon, to, uh, to make connection, to, make, uh, to, to communicate. So we know that, yes, on one hand, the social distancing is, is there. It exists. And, um, but with it, it, in a way, creates a certain uh, desire within people to interact, to have, uh, to have more uh, uh, communication with others. Now, there's a certain... Two, you can say two, two complete opposites. On one end, every person wants to have his privacy. Every person would like to have privacy. On the other hand, no one wants to be alone. No one would like to stay alone. Everyone wants to be, or, or you know, psychologists say that the greatest fear of a person is to be left alone, to stay alone. Uh, on the other hand, everyone likes to have his privacy. I think that... Uh, this virus, because it's already here, so we said that we're trying to learn whatever we can from it. It's, it's an opportunity for us from, uh, to learn from it. So what can it, can, what can it teach us? And I think that, uh, you know, if, if I would go, the typical uh, picture, if you would go to a restaurant or to a coffee shop or to wherever it is, you would see two people that are eating lunch together, but everyone is with his own cell phone like this. <coughs> right now, People want to have the interaction. People feel that um, what it caused is us trying to have connection or wanting to have a connection with the other, but not just the connection with uh, Facebook or WhatsApp or Zoom or, or all of these types of interaction. Rather, I would like to see you. I would like to be next to you. I would like to shake your hand. It, it, it sounds uh, in a way scary now to shake someone's hand, but it, it, it causes people, or I'm sorry, it, it awakens uh, the desire uh, between people to have this communication, not just the virtual one, rather the, uh, the, the actual connection. Yeah, now I can see it in the hospital. Uh, one of the, one of, I think it's a, it's a beautiful story because it showed the, um, the staff itself, a uh, unity of a, of a community. We said before that uh, I think our community uh, got, got hurt very much from it. Um, but because we're a community, because we're together, that's why we got hurt so much. So um, I had one patient in ICU. And uh, yes, it was, uh, it was her last uh, moments. And uh, the family wanted, uh, they wanted to be there, but no one was allowed because she was a, a positive patient. COVID positive. So, uh, so we made everything through Zoom. Now, the staff was shocked. How is it possible that, uh, that a Zoom meeting we have, we had, I think, 50 or 60 people on the Zoom. And they wanted to do the entire process, all the prayers, all the tefillot, every, everything, the, the entire family wanted to be there, the whole process. And, uh, and after that, they wanted to have her, to bring her to, to burial the same day. Now, it was a very, very hard day, meaning there were so many cases of people that passed away during this day that also people that died the day before, it was impossible to, uh, to bring them to burial even a day after. Um, I spoke to the staff over there. When the staff saw, saw this unity, when they saw how the entire family wants 
to merge, wants to be together. Uh, one of the nurses there told me, look, Rabbi, I'm now supposed to go on a break. But since I've seen what was happening now, I mean, to have 50 or 60 people on a Zoom, just to have final prayers, we're talking about kids, uh, grandchildren, cousins, nephews, all the family. He told me I'm giving up my break. I'm going on to prepare everything, to set up everything with her. I want, I want everything to take place today. Um, she was taken out. She was brought to burial. Maybe, maybe four hours after she died. Uh, personally, I've never seen such a thing in the hospital. Never, I've been there for three years. On a, on, in regular times, I haven't seen, seen such a thing. Now, when we have so many cases, forget about it. My personal opinion is this uh, unity, sadly, for these, uh, for these uh, moments, for these events, but sadly, um, it happened to be in such a way that, yes, she was able to be brought to Kvugat Israel that same day, three or four hours later. Just tell me, uh, Rabbi Pinto or uh, Rabbi Pelulu, how much time do I still have? Because Rabbi Pinto told me around 30 minutes. So uh, I have uh, five more points, but, uh, but it depends on the time. How long do I still have? A few minutes. A few minutes. Okay, very good. Uh, Shane. Uh, maybe we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll finish with Shane. So uh, if I would tell people, if, you, if we would see, any of us would see uh, a few months ago, uh, someone with um, with a mask going in IGA, we would look at it and it would say, "Come on, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing." And people would do, I think, almost everything just not to be embarrassed to such an extent that it says, "When a person embarrasses someone else, it's as if he killed him." And some say it's even worse. I'll, I'll give a story from uh, from the past when I was uh, when I was a vice principal. So there was a story. Both of them, it wasn't here, but this story is a real story. Maybe some of you heard it. There was a child that had. Um, he was a young. Um, I think he was at the age of uh, ten. I think around ten years old, and um, he had a hard time reading. No, he was younger, younger than ten, but he had a hard time reading. He has a certain dyslexia, and he had a hard time reading. And in class, a part of the, the weekly um, uh, reading, um, part of the weekly reading, everyone was supposed to read. And he was supposed to read in front of the entire class. And he had glasses. So every week, um, he, um, he broke his glasses. Now, how did they find out about it? They found out about it because they saw that every week he comes with certain bruises in his body. One day it was real bruises, and they found out that his, uh, his father is, uh, is beating him. And the reason his father was beating him is because uh, he would come every week with broken glasses. And his father told him, in general, his father was, was, beating, was beating him, but, uh, but when he came with the broken glasses, his father was so upset, we need to pay for a new pair of glasses <clears throat> because you don't, care, don't take properly, proper care of them. And they, uh, they found out that uh, every time he, it was his turn to read, he would break his glasses. He said, I prefer to get hit by my father, but not to be embarrassed in front of the entire class. I prefer to do this, just not to be embarrassed. Now, if we were told now that the virus would go away, if all of us would wear masks of a rabbit and have uh, big, big hands on our hands, we would have to put wooden sticks because this somehow, the combination of this would make the virus go away. I'm sure that all of us would do it if it would be scientifically proven. So this, in a way, this virus brought us to a certain reality that you need to do what you have to do. You're embarrassed, could be, but you'll have to overcome this embarrassment because if you want to survive, if you want to live, if you want to stay healthy, you need to do certain things that, yes, they don't look that nice. They don't look that beautiful. Walking around with a mask in the, in the street or, uh, or with gloves wherever you go is not such an exciting thing. It's not so nice. And, yes, it's embarrassing. But, uh, but when a person, the lesson of it is that uh, I think that it taught us 
that we should do what we need to do and not only focus on does it look good, does it look nice, is it okay, what will the other person say, what will the other person not say, how will he judge me, how will he not judge me, rather um, to do what has to be done. The two examples that I, uh, that I have from the hospital are two people. Both of them, it's a miracle that they, uh, that they survived, that they lived. One of them, the family calls and calls me and asks me, or at least it was, uh, how is he doing? We were embarrassed that he will be seen in such a condition, in such a situation, and who's looking at him and who's going around. And when he wakes up, so the first thing is, did I say anything? Did I do anything while I was asleep, while, while I was out? This is, this is his main concern to such an extent that he needs to take something uh, for the um, uh, psychiatric aspect of his, uh, of his treatment more than the physical. Right now the physical is okay, but he's so concerned about uh, what will I do, how will I look like, how do I look like, that it has a certain impact on his uh, psychological, um, um, in a such, such psychologi psychological level. Another one, is uh, an older person that uh, that uh, while he wasn't feeling well, he um, he's not there for the COVID. He was there for something else, but um, but uh, he missed the funeral of his uh, of his sister, and uh, and he he's there now only with one leg. And when I came to visit him the first time, he was with me and he was laughing and talking and asked him, you know, how do you do that? So he told me, Rabbi. It's a reality I'm here, right? I don't care. Let them look at me that I'm like this. Who cares? I'm alive. I feel good. <clears throat> if you ask me what it is that I need, Rabbi, if you can please get me a good piece of chocolate. I love chocolate. We can't bring anything in. I need to have good chocolate. Can you bring me chocolate? And I can tell you that he's now out of the hospital. His spirit is such a positive spirit. He didn't care. Yes, I'm now in bed. I look like this. I look like that. Let them laugh at me. But I survived. I'm healthy. That's the most important thing. So the mask, in a way, teaches us, be who you are. It says that all the beginnings are hard. One of the perushim is all the beginnings are hard because at first we try to make a certain impression. So when we try to make an impression, we use someone else's mask. And it's very hard to be someone else for a long period of time. But once we take off the other person's mask and we just act the way that we are, then everything becomes smooth and normal. So this is, uh, this is the, the fifth uh, lesson, um, and uh, I think, it's, I think the, the time has passed. I, I trust what uh, Rabbi Pinto told me, that you are very uh, wise and educated people, that from the uh, five points that I gave you, you will be able to already understand what the, the four other points are supposed to be. And uh, that's it. I wish you all a healthy, a healthy week. Keep Thanks. yourself safe. And uh, you, your family, take advantage of this, of this time to be with the family. Uh, all those points are connected also to the family. Try to spend the good time with them. Give them the time. Be who you are with them. It's, it's a great experience to be with, with the kids and with the family home. There is no one to, nowhere, nowhere to run.